morning's scripture is from Genesis book 3. Now, the snake was the most intelligent of all the wild animals that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say that you shouldn't eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the snake, We may eat the fruit of the garden's trees, but not the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden. God said, don't eat from it and don't touch it or you will die. No, you won't die. You know, God knows that on the day you eat from it, you will see clearly and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. The woman saw that the tree was beautiful with delicious food and that the tree would provide wisdom. So she took some of its fruit and ate it, and also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it. Then they both saw clearly and knew that they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made garments for themselves. During that day's cool evening breeze, they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the Lord God in the middle of the garden's trees. The Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? The man replied, Well, I heard your sound in the garden, but I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. Who told you that you were naked? Did you eat from the tree which I commanded you not to eat? Well, the woman you gave me, she gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate. The Lord God said to the woman, What have you done? The, the snake tricked me. And I ate. The Lord God made the man and his wife leather clothes and dressed them. The Lord God said, These human beings have now become like one of us, knowing good and evil. So he doesn't stretch out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. The Lord God sent him out of the Garden of Eden to till the fertile land from which he was taken. He drove out the man and the woman. To the east of the Garden of Eden, he stationed winged creatures wielding flaming swords to guard the way to the tree of life. Amen. So you saw the most handsome Adam, most beautiful Eve, and most precious snake this morning, <laughs> and wonderful God. <laughs> so we are continuing our reconnecting to the creation story, and now we move on to the second creation story, that, which begins in chapter 2 and continues on to the beginning part of chapter 4. Today's part of the story in the garden, was one of the most familiar one, is often called what? The fall story or the story that we hear the, as about original sin. The fall and the original sin, these are the big theological concepts that Christians have heard and studied about for years. Because the story is often considered to tell us something very fundamental about us, about God, and how the God and the world and us are related. That's how we often hear this story. But what if the story is not really about the sin and the fall to begin with? What if the original sin and the fall is not really a fundamental matter to God and therefore to us to begin with? First of all, the story doesn't have either word, sin or fall. That's all how people later beginning with Paul and then Augustine and all these founding theologians, understood this story and captured and heard this story through that lens. Oh, this was paradise and fall. Oh, this was violation of the first commandment, you know, first disobedience. So that's original sin. But there is no word sin or fall. In the story, you heard God. God didn't ask Adam and Eve, why you guys have sinned? God simply asked, what happened? 
right? What then can be this can this story be about? Of course, this story this story can be about the fall and the original sin. But also, it can be many different things, including those ones. But if we read it closely, and it tells something about all human beings struggle, it points to a human condition. The problem begins in, into the story when humans, the woman and the man, begin to question God's provisions the way of life that God has put before them and begin to desire something more. Story says what? The snake said to the woman, you won't die. God knows. The snake is saying, you know, God knows something that you don't know. God is keeping some secret. God knows that on the day you eat from it, you will see clearly and you will be like God knowing good and evil. And then woman respond, no words. It says, woman saw that the tree was beautiful with delicious food and that the tree would provide wisdom. So she took some of its fruits and ate it. See, Adam and Eve had all they needed to be in God's creation, right? They were made good. All things around them were good and plentiful enough. But somehow they desired more. They wanted to know what God only knows. So they thought. They didn't trust God or God's provisions. They couldn't live within what God has provided them. They somehow thought God may be keeping something from us that we really want or need. So if this story is about the sin, it's not about not observing commandment. It's not about even disobeying God. It is about mistrusting God or not trusting God and God's goodness for creation. For all. So what happens when they did that? When they thought, when they got what they thought beautiful, good, and wise? What happened when they thought that one thing they are missing? What happened when they desired more and have the knowledge? It says, then they both saw clearly and knew that they were naked. So they saw the fig leaves together and made garments for themselves. They didn't get the wisdom. They got what? A new consciousness. Suddenly they are looking at each other and themselves with a whole new way. See, they were naked all along and had no problem with it. After this event, after not trusting God and God's goodness, a new self-consciousness enters. And with it, shame enters into human condition. They became aware of each other's nakedness. So the first response was what? Now I have something that needed to be covered. That no one need to know. That makes me shameful. Interesting, the root words for shame in all, you know, English means to cover, to cover. It comes from this story. God created people to be a helper to one another, right? In this second story, God created Adam and Eve, and it's not good to be alone, so we need to create companion for one another, and all creation too. Now, once they were created to support and help one another, now they are shameful of each other. What God created good is now Lorongo suddenly good enough. Not good enough. It needed to be covered. Human beings were created with God's very breath, according to the second story, the God's spirit. 
filled inside of their whole being. Now their outer being, the nakedness, is all that matters. How they are looked, judged, valued, perceived by others and by themselves. They no longer care what's in them. Now they care suddenly how they look and judged and perceived. And when that self-consciousness enters, when that shame enters, the reaction becomes, first reaction is what? They start to blame one another. It's fascinating. What happened? And, and the man said, man is, the Adam is, even though there was not many lines, he said what? He didn't, just didn't say as we understand it. Eve didn't know. Man, he said, the woman that you gave me, the you gave me, so God, Adam is pointing, it's really your fault. It's not mine. You created all this mess. And then old, always Eve said, pointing somebody else. We start to blame one another. And then, and later, when God came, up, came to looking for them, they hid themselves, right? Fear enters. There was no fear of God. Now, there is fear. And it keeps people from being honest to God and to one another. They cover not only themselves to, from one another, but from, to God, from God. So shame is a fruit of not trusting God's goodness. It is a human condition in which we live and move and have our being. The Christian psycho uh, psychologist Louis Smithes defines shame as this, a vague, undefined heaviness that presses on our spirit, dampens our gratitude for the goodness of life, and slackens the free flow of joy. Shame seeps into and discolors all our other feelings, primarily about ourselves, but about almost everyone, everything else in our life as well. Another psychologist defines shame as the root of dysfunctions in many relationships, especially in families. And by psychologists and other scholars, shame is increasingly recognized as a powerful, painful, and potentially dangerous emotion, especially those who don't understand its origins or know how to manage it. Shame is a human condition. It happens because it exists in all human relationships. It destroys our inner soul, just like it did Adam and Eve. It turned their focus from their inner being, the God spirit in them, to their outer being and perceptions. So, Shame is a root of low self-esteem, depression, isolation, a lot of addictions. It also distorts human relationships by blaming, resentment, abuse, manipulation, you name it, and competition. It's interesting, the next story, Cain and Abel, Abel's story, is about competition that led to the violence. In that story, the first word sin comes from God is saying to the Cain, and sin is lurking at your heart before Cain ended up killing his brother. So according to that, sin is about this universal power that tried to lure human beings to turn this blame, turn this, you know, misfound, you know, self-consciousness into violence to one another. That's a whole other story. It changes our relationship with God. Fear enters it. And somehow we cannot be vulnerable and honest before God. We cannot be naked before God. Shame enters because we do not trust God's goodness in us to begin with and in all of God's people. It is interesting that Adam and Eve somehow felt that they needed something more to be better. Isn't that interesting? Somehow, in that supposed to be perfect 
paradise, right? Often we call it, right? How could they want more or better? That tells us that our understanding of this story need a refocus. We often think that Adam and Eve were perfect. We often think whatever God created at the beginning was perfect. That's why it was a paradise. That's why you need to fall from it. Right? But were they really? Were God's creation perfect to begin with? God, did God really create all things perfect and all things in perfect harmony, in perfect relationship with God and with, with one another? That's what we think we hear it. But if God created such a perfect creation, perfect human beings, how could they fail? How could that world go wrong? That's the very definition and evidence of what? Not being perfect. Can you, can you, are you with me? If something is perfect, then you cannot, it can never fail. See, the, never in the Bible, in the creation, two creation stories, there's no word perfect enters. Instead, what's the word that defines God's creation? Good. God created the world and us good, not perfect. That's an important difference. A lot of people suffer with this misinformed understanding of God's creation, that God created us perfect, so we fell, so we somehow restored that perfection. God created human beings good enough to be part of God's good creation, to live and love as God would live and love. But that doesn't mean we would be perfect and do things always perfectly as God wants us to be and do. This is why we come to earth as babies. No babies are perfect. Have you ever seen a perfect baby? Maybe for the first two years. No babies are perfect, but all babies are good. Not because of who they are, but because God created them. See, not being perfect is neither a failure nor a sin before God. It is a condition that enters because of our mistrust of God. See, God's whole creation was good, but not perfect. It was not created to follow some perfect divine plan step by step. It was created to live in faithful yet always growing relationship with God and with one another. God's creation is, a, is an open Creation. It's not a closed one with the perfect things in perfect places. God's creation is filled with goodness that is waiting to grow and bloom. It's a garden you have to till, you have to take care of it, you have to harvest, you have to weed, you have to make it work. But God provided everything that the garden needed to just do so, and people in place. The theologian Terence Pray Time captures this saying, God may not know all the details about the future of us and the world. Hey, that when we say God is all-knowing, did God know Holocaust going to happen? Did God know Twin Tower is going to come down? Did God know unarmed black men would be, you know, stopped and lose their lives? Did God know that humanity is going to create, you know, slavery? Did God know that some people will stand up and vote 
to abolish slavery? Did God know that the human beings and Americans will come together, the creator society, where the we see each other as a God's blessings, not by the lines and color of our skins? Did God know that you know, the people who will still keep the faith even after Holocaust, seeing the suffering of so many innocents? God knows the future as possibilities. That's the definition of goodness. God may not know all the details about how the world is going to turn out, but God knows that all will always have goodness, that all human beings have that good possibilities. And when we are in right relationship with God, that possibilities will turn into realities. It will restore the garden. It will bring heaven on earth as Jesus prayed. This is why God violates even God's own rule in this story. It's fascinating. God said, indeed, you will die if you eat this fruit. And next day, Adam and Eve didn't die. They got the consequences, but they didn't die. God violated God's own rule. Why? Because God believed in possibilities. Goodness was not squashed. It might be damaged, but goodness could be mended and healed and restored. That's why God didn't kill them. Instead, what? God saw the garments, the scripture said. Fig leaves were not good enough. God saw the clothings for this mistrusting, yet still good, Adam and Eve. That's the message of creation. See, grace mends the brokenness. God's goodness cannot be totally taken away by anything that we do or something done to us. This is how God engages in fulfilling the goodness of the creation. This is how the God works in through and in the midst of history to continue to work on God's promise to bring the garden back to humanity. See, shame is a condition. It's not sin. Shame is not something that you should be shameful about. Shame is something that which you need to bring before God. Because God is the one who saws the garment to cover you in a way, not to be away from one another, not to hide from God, but to be on a journey with God for their restoration. This is why we need to be gracious to one another. This is why we should not try to cover us and our shame. Rather, we need to come to one another, to God. We need to sow something gracious forgiving and understanding to each other. It's fascinating that God saw them a garment, even though they are kicked out of Garden of Eden. The scripture said they were led out of the Eden to continue the purpose that God has given them. He says to till the ground, to harvest the creation. No matter how not perfect it may be, God is putting this imperfect yet still good God's people to work on it with a garment that God sewed for them. See, our world is no paradise. I don't need to explain to you that. Our life is no paradise. 
we still live in the east of Eden, where temptation to mistrust God's goodness is abundant, where temptation to want more, to have more, the pressure to be perfect, uh, all avail. Where we still hear voices that denies our belovedness that we are not good enough. Where we feel we had to cover and hide from God and from one another. It might happen to you, or you might be the source of the shame for some others. Or it just happened to be that way. That's the condition we are in. But the good news is that even in the midst of our shame, you and I and all God's people are still good because God still sows the garments for each and every one of us. So it is my hope that one thing you and I as a believer in God's creation, you and I as a baptized people of God, as God's belovedness, let's not dwell in shame. Let's bring shame to shame. Let's bring that before God. Let's be honest and claim that though we have brothers and sisters in our Watertown building who are in a recovery journey, we still struggle, still imperfect, but one thing that makes recovery works is what? I own my shame. And I'm not shameful about my shame because God can make a difference. It can be mended. That's one thing that God's created people has, have. And that's one thing that our shame-filled world needs. Let us be in silence before we sing our closing hymn. Do not be 
afraid I am with you. I have called you each by name. Come and follow me, I will bring you home. I love you and you are mine. Friends, tomorrow morning when you wake up and Get out of the shower and put on your clothes. Remember that God has sewn your clothes for you. That you no longer have to hide your shame, live in fear. God has healed and still healing those places. And those clothes are the ones that show you that God is still working on that. Those are the clothes that God sold for you to go out and be God's beloved and work for God's goodness in God's world. And now the blessing of God who created you, who redeems you, and who saws the garments of grace and healing for each and every one of us be with you forever and ever. Amen.